So beloved is man's not beloved by Hashem, he's beloved by human beings as well. Uh, so therefore, there's this mitzvah to, uh, to, to love other people. And um, that's uh, the, the, the uh, um, by extension of Hashem. Otherwise, people have no value. People have no meaning, no purpose. You want to shoot somebody, shoot somebody, punch his head in, whatever you want to do. You want to steal from him, no big deal. But because he's created the image of Hashem, that's when he achieves holiness, specialness, beauty, and that beauty should be not only respected, that beauty should be loved. You should find something in everyone that you love. Now, obviously, you're going to love um, those that are closest to you more. You love your husband, you love your wife, you love your children, uh, your parents, your siblings. But the point is that we, our job is to love all of humanity. Now, the love of humanity is a mitzvah called to love, uh, uh, to love um, uh, your, your friend like yourself. Uh, that is uh, in the book, mitzvah number, anybody want to tell me? Um, um, uh, it's a mitzvah number 60. So mitzvah number 60 is the mitzvah to love everybody. Um, however, we're going to learn that there is the mitzvah of loving everybody. It has uh, uh, distinctions, which we'll learn. About. We talked about a moment ago. We'll talk about it again in a minute. So, therefore, there are dual obligation. obligations. Obligations to God, obligations to, to, to people. And this dual obligation between the two is the concept that they're interrelated. As we said, you only love people by extension of Hashem. You have to love Hashem first. Uh, you have to uh, recognize Hashem. Recognizing Hashem is the idea of um, recognizing Hashem uh, is the idea that everything flows from that. Um, to recognize human beings without Hashem is impossible. To recognize Hashem only and have to recognize the extensions of his of, of his children also is also impossible and in, 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 inappropriate. And so, uh, let's take a look at Mitzvah number one. It says in the Torah, chapter and verse, Shmo, second book of the Torah, chapter 20. Right? And it says verse two. Verse two means what? Verse two means, it's the, the, very, the, very, the second sentence of chapter 20. But this should remain firm in your minds. When you want to look up, the Ten Commandments are what we call the Ten Statements of Hashem. Always look at the second book, chapter 20. Real easy. Shmos 20. Okay? In this, uh, um, um, in this the, the discovery of uh, this uh, first statement of Hashem uh, lies, in the, lies in the midst of knowing Hashem. So what does it mean? Says the Rechav Chaim. The Exalted One, the Blessed One, brought all existing entities into being and all the worlds by his power and blessed wish. That means everything that you see in the world is created by him, including electric lights, including cars, including cell phones. Everything is created by Hashem. Uh, whether or not uh, he used the human mind uh, which he created to be able to come up with that is another issue. But, but the point is, is that he brought everything to being. So when you talk about God, the first thing you have to talk about is the creator. That's the first thing. Uh, so what is called creation? I mean, man's creative too. We talked about that. How the Jew particularly is creative. And how the Jew used his mind to, to, come, to, to, to create brand new ideas, concepts, thoughts, and so forth. Uh, even Goyim uh, can do that in, in, on, a, on a physical, materialistic level, like Thomas Edison and others, uh, and the, the, the Bell Telephone. But uh, the, 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 the Jew, this creativity is unique in that it's a spiritual creativity. More discovery of God, more discovery of truth, more discovery of reality. But the point is, is that um, Hashem's creativity is different than the human creativity. And that's what you have to know. What's the difference? The difference is 
Humans create something out of something, the raw materials. God created something out of nothing. And so there was this great story about these, uh, these uh, great scientists who were trying to uh, come up with all sorts of creative thoughts and ideas and uh, the teachings and, uh, uh, and, and great, great machines. Now, of course, one of the great uh, uh, teachings, <laughs> uh, one, of, one of the great creations of, of, of machines is the creation called uh, uh, a robot. Now, of course, many of you read science fiction or seen these uh, in science fiction movies, you're going to see all these robots and stuff. Anybody in this room ever seen a robot in its life? It's insanity. It's total insanity. I'm in a hotel. I get on the phone. I say, uh, 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 the front desk, would you please get, send me, uh, would you please send me uh, 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 up, uh, so a box of dishes, whatever. And uh, they say, fine. We're not coming ourselves because it's over. So therefore, what do they do? They send up a robot. <laughs> you know, this actually happened. They, the, the robot is programmed. You know, he, he goes up on the elevator on his own. I don't know how he does this. And he presses the button. He goes off the right door. Comes right to my door. Ding, ding, ding. Opens up. Hello. This is your family robot. Here's your dishes. I take my dishes. And he goes right back. This is true. It's happening. And Bob's face, right? See, it's science fiction, right? Put in all eyes. Um, of course, if you really want to be enterprising, really creative, how about we create a person? I should create a person? That's New York a person. Yeah. <laughs> you want to create a person? That's how we feel it sounds like that. So, so we try and uh, we, we, we create this person, let's say, and um, and the, the science, the, the, all the mad scientists are in the laboratory, and the, the, the fishers and the waters and the and the the, 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 the solutions and this, they're doing this, doing that, creating everything, right? And they were a little stymied with one last step, one last step. I mean, and, and they're trying to figure it all out. How do you want to do this? How do you want to create a, a, a human being? You know? You want to create a human being? They figure they can. These great, these great guys, these, these uh, self aggrandized, self absorbed, uh, absolutely arrogant uh, scientists who think that they control the world. Right? And they're working and they're working and they're working feverishly in a month and a year and two years and five years. How do you create a human being? Finally, they were this. It says, get your own dirt. Who gets it? You get it? Get your own dirt. Everybody, every scientist in the world needs something and some things in order to create the human being. Uh, and that's how the human being operates. Hashem. Created something out of nothing. Now, can you understand that? Can you imagine? I can. I, I believe it. I, I can't explain it. But why do I believe it? The answer is because whatever I can cannot do, by definition, God can. That's basically the point of understanding who Hashem is. So there's a mixture to understand that God is the creator. He created something out of nothing. Then it says further. He watches over everything. That means he is the supervisor. But in order to be a supervisor, right, he also has to be a sustainer, a creator, a sustainer, and a supervisor. So when you want to know who God is, if you want to do the mitzvah properly, you got to know he's the creator, sustainer, supervisor. Sustainer means what? That everything continues on because of him. He takes his will away for one second, the world's blown up. He takes his will away from any single individual. One second, that person is dead. We all continue living every single successive second because he wills it. So we behoove us to believe that and behoove us, of course, to, to follow what he teaches us and tells us. Um, we have to know that uh, Hashem is the supervisor. What does the supervisor mean over here? He watches over us. That means that he asks us or, or tells us what we have to do. 
and what we can't do, and the 613, and um, uh, he rewards and punishes. Reward and punishment is part of this mitzvah. The realization that God supervises of, of humanity, knows everything we do, knows everything we're thinking, and uh, will respond consequentially. And so therefore, um, the idea is to believe that Hashem creates, sustains with his constant will. He also provides direction, 613 specific directions. And the directions, of course, carry with it a punishment and, um, and, and reward. It's important to note that those that commandments are only for those that are commanded. Jews, obviously. Uh, Non-Jews are not commanded. So if a non-Jew wants to try and do any one of the uh, commandments of God, that's a, well, it's a wonderful thing, but there's no reward. Uh, that, I shouldn't say there's no There is some minimal reward, but there is no punishment uh, whatsoever if there's a failure because we're volunteer at best. And so therefore, the person who is trying to make a, um, a, a movement forward, that person uh, eventually, with, through conversion, becomes becomes uh, uh, commanded, and then, of course, obviously runs into the, to the issue of reward and punishment. One of the issues, one of the statements that we use at the conversion process, at the ceremony, to try and discourage the convert from completing the task, which is our job, is to tell him or her that up until now, there are no consequences to your actions one way or the other, except, of course, for the seven um, no card laws, the laws of humanity, the mitzvahs b'nei Noah. Uh, but all the mitzvahs that you've been tempted to do or try and working with, um, they don't count. I mean, they don't really count in terms of, let's say, a a a, 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 a punishment if, if you fail. But now, the punishment is real. Are you prepared to accept the punishment you fail? Prepared to accept uh, uh, that. Uh, it now counts. So of course, people are learning and through the conversionary process, and they learn these rules and those rules and these details and those details. Um, of course, you all know that Jews are very, very uh, they think in a whole lot of details. How you take off the, the, the hot food on the Shabbos? How you put it back? What's the third vessel? How do you do this? How do you do that? All these details. How do you pray? What do you say first? What do you say second? The prayer book is organized and ordered in such a fashion. I mean, everything is a detail. Person seeks to convert without knowing all those details, they're on a risk. They're on a risk of making a mistake, which I guess now doesn't really matter that much, let's say, for the person who's not converted. Oh, who's not yet converted. But for eventually, when the conversion comes, then the person is going to think twice about, am I ready? Um, or well, really feel confident that I can keep Shabbat properly. But if you really, really, really feel confident, well, keeping kosher is relatively easy. I mean, you have your you can't keep kosher with all the secret issues out there. Um, unless, you, unless you can't read the signatures or whatever on packages. Um, um, but but um, persons need to, to, to be really on top of, uh, when you talk about on top of your game, the real, the real issue really is always the shop. So we're going to talk about later uh, before we and today. The shop is part of the 10 statements that was uh, uttered yesterday as well, to be sure. Um, but um, but uh, the, the, the uh, idea is that you have to on, on top of your game and into your details. And so, um, and so uh, holidays come. Now, holidays are once a year. So that really it, it takes a lot of uh, attention. The basic ruling for us as, uh, as observant Jews, observant born Jews for that matter, is that there should be a constant in your life, a constant learning of all the chants over and over and over and over again, including rabbis, over and over and over and over again. One day, you're a rabbi, and someone calls you up and asks you a question, and for 50 years, you've never heard of it. Good question. You never know. This is infinite. Someone called me up on Friday. I didn't know the answer. My mom did not know the answer. I look it up. Even then, I'm not sure. Uh, it's a lifelong thing. So anybody, the Chavetz Chaim says it, our, our author, the Chavetz Chaim teaches, anyone who does not learn 
the laws of Shabbos on a constant level to how his life is not a Shomer Shabbos. That means when? That means I'm a born Jew. I went to a Jewish school. I went to Yeshiva. I got my smicha. I'm a rabbi. And I got to learn the laws of Shabbos over and over and over again. Every single, at least every single week. Once a week, maybe on Shabbos itself. Not a bad idea. None right. But I did learn the laws of Shabbos on Shabbos. But every single week, there should be a lessons of uh, learning on Shabbos. Well, I don't, I don't have a class available. It doesn't, it doesn't hit my schedule. We had a book. Buy a book. Read it. Read it together with your friend. Read it together with your spouse. But every single week, there should be the study of the laws of Shabbos. Now, when it comes to holidays, so the more is quite clear. The more says every 30 days before every holiday, you should be reviewing that holiday. Now, I've been keeping Pesach for half a century or more. And every single time Pesach comes 30 days before, I'm reviewing those laws. No, they're pretty clear, right? So I read them and it's all tedious, boring. But well, wait a second. For the first time in my life in a half a century, I just realized something new. Now, to be honest, there was only one thing out of 10 pages. Right? But nevertheless, it was worth reading those 10 pages for that one random thing. So that's the idea getting across the importance of realizing that details matter, learning therefore is imperative, and therefore that's the way you perform mitzvah number one of believing in Hashem. Believing in Hashem means I believe he's the creator, something out of nothing. He's the sustainer by his will, specifically. And individually, constant survival. And number three, um, and, and, just, and number two, again, you get that perspective also of Hashem has realized that someday someone, uh, maybe the Glenn got some there, he's also passed away, a rather younger fellow, too. Uh, and uh, of course, it's his own sad, uh, maybe a life and death of a time. Um, I knew his fellow, but. He, in fact, he studied with me. Uh, he had a bit of problem, a lot of problems. And the tomorrow the thing. God took the wind away. And that's how you have to deal with it. You have to know how to deal with life and death by understanding that God is the sustainer. And then, of course, God's the supervisor. He gives us directions, 613 plus all the details. And furthermore, there is reward and punishment and consequence on those details. Uh, two more points to understand about. This mitzvah it says the Chavetz Chaim. This is the foundation of our faith, and whoever does not believe this denies the very main principle: the one and only God has no share or right amongst the Jewish people. Atheists lose their part with us. Very sad. So I guess if really you want to reach out and be an outreach person, try to. You know, Bring more Jews and the love of other Jews, what would you do? You start with trying to talk about God. And that's the best way to do it. I mean, you can start about Shabbos, and you can start about kosher, and you can start about filling and other things. That's great. I'm not saying I'm putting it down, but I'm thinking that maybe the best way to start is to say, let's talk about God. Well, uh, he's going to talk pretty strong. He's got his proof, right? Because we like to, we like to, uh, this, this, this proof real easy, you know. Um, most, most people are on a conversation like that go, well, prove to me this a God. So when I turn around to him, he would say, say, prove to me this no God. Back in his court. Prove to me this no God. Now I want to hear proofs. That means I'm ready to give you proofs that the shed. My rib would give over seven proofs. I mean, rather more them all and, and really the cogent proofs. I'm not right now, but uh, basically, basically, you throw it back in the store and say, Prove to me, it's not wrong. Show me your proofs. Well, you know, the atheists have no proofs. That's, that's the truth. The conversation, you'll learn that. And uh, that they really find themselves uh, uh, really uh, uh, like, Whoa, proofs. Um, well, um, well, uh, I really don't have any proofs, you know. Oh, what you're saying is you don't know about God. Well, then come and learn. Teach me. 
I don't believe in absolutes. Are you sure about that? I'm sure. Are you absolutely sure? On our absolutes, aren't you? Yes, if a Jew is born into Judaism, but they identify as an atheist, are they not considered Jewish? I don't think they would be on it in the Torah and the Wizard with the big uh, with, uh, with, with, with count for the name. I would not, if I knew a person was an atheist, I would not count for my name. There's a book called Imagine, imagine, imagine when he's called up to the Torah, this guy, right? I, I find this several. Yeah, he's called up to the Torah. Let's say he's counting good, they scroll down to the Torah and Shabbos Lord, you know? And he says, Asher Bocha Bonu Mikalamim. Thank you, God, for choosing us from all nations. Wait, wait a second. You don't believe in God. Well, I try, I enjoy it. I get a kick out of being called up to the Torah. That's a good kick. It's a little honor. It costs me a couple bucks, you know, it's a chain of shoes, you know? <laughs> Come on, wake up. No belief. Number one, that's a number one. Sit so down. If I told you to memorize all the mitzvahs in this book, could you memorize at least one? We could do that. Okay. So that's yes. That that was our teaching for yesterday. We stood up and we uh, stood up for the ten statements for the fourteen commandments, and uh, um, and uh, and this is a uh, the foundation of our faith. Um, uh, uh, one other point about this mitzvah. Is that it's not a mitzvah really to believe at all. It's really a mitzvah to know. And the difference between faith, belief, and knowledge is illustrated with the following story. Uh, I'm traveling uh, uh, up to the north of San Francisco, and uh, I have uh, I'm out of cash, so I go to a Seven Eleven store and I say, uh, "Would you cash my check, please?" Because I need cash. Uh, it's $25. The guy looks at me and he says, you know, you got an arms on your face. You a rabbi? Yeah. Oh, well. Okay. Give me 25 bucks. So we all know that that guy has faith in it. He had no belief in how it's wrong because that can matter that check can bounce for your heart. Or maybe it's a bad check. Yeah, but you got You can't live on faith. The 7 Eleven guy gave you that $25 for the food. Can't live on faith. There's hope and faith. But uh, <laughs> you, you, you can't make your life on that. You can't give 25 bucks on that. You can't keep shot. The room is Saturday for that. But then it's belief. I walked into the next store, 7 Eleven. The guy says to me, Look, I'll cash your check for you, but uh, it's got to be, uh, you got to give me uh, your driver's license, uh, your, your credit card. And I want to see that you're that you're a, a viable citizen out of your 25 bucks. Okay. Give me 15. And he's got belief in me. And that's pretty good. He needs to ask for some food, but he still isn't sure. He isn't sure. Because I mean, how do you know? Maybe that check is still balanced. In that regard, therefore, what are you doing? You're dealing with the uh, <laughs> once again, uh, uh, you can't. You can, uh, Bet 25 bucks on that, 50 bucks, or, 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 or put yourself in that kind of danger. And, 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 uh, and, and trust someone who you believe in, but you're not sure. Then I finally moved up a little further to San Francisco over there. And as I was driving, I got into the next 7 Eleven and I want to ask for $100 for the 7 Eleven store. And as I'm ready to go up to the store and I go up to the cashier and ask him for $100 and for, and for a, a total exchange, you know, all of a sudden, Freddie's there. And Freddie says, Oh, Rabbi Block, how are you? Hey, I haven't seen you. What are you doing in San Francisco? So he says to the 7 Eleven guy, You can trust this guy. I know him. <clears throat> That's called knowledge. I don't know that. That's called knowledge. You have to know God that way. To commit your life to Hashem means you have to know clear as day, as clear as your ten fingers, that God's real, God's true, and that's all it's about something. And those are 613 riches. And that's an absolute. If you recognize that, then you're fulfilling mitzvah number one. Now, we're going to skip here in our book and go on to 
the second half of the book. The second half of the book is um, the second half of the book is the books of the, the, the mitzvahs, the negative mitzvahs. And I would like to bring to your attention uh, mitzvah number eight. Second half of the book, the book of ne the negative mitzvahs, mitzvah number eight. Mitzvah number eight says, it is a negative commandment to entertain the thought that there is another God except Hashem. So in other words, this is statement number two in the 10 statements of yesterday. Is that correct? I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. That's mitzvah number eight. So we want to do this mitzvah. Of course, we all know these are constant mitzvahs. There's the constant faith in Hashem and the constant rejection of anything else. Let's take a look at number eight. Teach, Torah teaches us, you shall have no other gods before me. Once again, the, the source of Shmos, second book. Once again, the source of the same chapter, chapter 20. But this is one sentence ahead, sentence number three. Whoever entertains the thought in his mind, it just gave it a consideration that there is another God except Hashem, or there's some partners or associates with Hashem, or maybe there's some substance to idol worship. And of course, the Chavis Chaim, as you can see, says heaven forbid each time. He denies the very fundamental principle of the one and only God. He denies Hashem. And it's a separate mitzvah. It's a negative, it's a negative mitzvah. This means to suggest that once you've established your sense of, 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 of awareness of Hashem, and once you really, really are clearly committed to this truth, you're not permitted to entertain the thought or consider any other issue. So in other words, if I'm walking down on Taylor Drive and I want to buy a suit of clothing and I go here, I go there, and I do this and I do that, and I look here and I look there, and I find the suit that I want. Cheapest one of what? <laughs> I find the suit that I want. Of course, I'm very simple with colors. I don't need too many colors. You know, black and white. Technically, colors never break in my life. <laughs> I, I just black and white. Huh? And, um, and I go and I buy the suit that I want. And it fits right, price is right, uh, and it's um, it, 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 it looks well on me, and I'm happy with it. I feel warm in it. Everything clicks. And then, as I take the suit out, I continue walking down the same street. I come to another shop, and I say, "Wait a second. Maybe that's a better suit. Maybe here's what I'll do. I'll go in and try that one on, and if it's better, I'll put this one or return this one, right?" Now, you may do that in clothing. You can't do that in life. There's no window shut. Frankly, I might tell you that in major decisions in life, window shopping is absolutely a deterrent and destructive. It's a big mistake. Do not uh, entertain the thought of something bad. You got what you got. You're dealing with it. You're working with it. Life's OK. Things are managing. You're making your moves you need to do. You think it's so something better somewhere else? That's, that's, that's a, a very unhealthy attitude. And it's certainly forbidden in terms of Hashem. In terms of Hashem, the idea of the consideration is absolutely forbidden by definition. To think of, well, maybe God has this assistant, that associate, maybe God's got a vice president, maybe God's got a secretary of state that helps things out over there. God got nobody, he doesn't need anybody. It's all singular. All him, and uh, therefore, this uh, is uh, the second mitzvah uh, of, of the uh, the ten statements. However, now in this mitzvah, in this statement, statement number two, in statement number two, it says, "You shall have." No other gods before me. That's the consideration. But then it says more. It says you shall not have them, make them, bow to them, serve them. And those are all separate mitzvahs, all within statement number two. Now, for instance, he'll say the other time he's over here. Um, if um, someone, uh, let's get to mitzvah number nine. It is forbidden to make yourself a graven image. That means you can't 
operate a uh, item store. Now we all know that I'm going to need a store, but operate that kind of store, right? So whether or not you believe or consider God or these graven images at all, doesn't matter. What matters is that you opened up a store. Can you be a jeweler and sell crosses? But I don't believe in it. It's nonsense. True. So you haven't violated the consideration of another God, but you have violated making one, owning one, selling one. And that's a separate violation. As you can see, it's a separate violation. Then it says, uh, let's go on to Mitzvah number uh, 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 10. Uh, well, that's uh, the same one, actually, basically, there's another, uh, the, the prohibition of doing it even for a boy. Uh, you, you can't even make one, if, uh, you can't even send a force to a boy. Number 11, you can't bow to it. In other words, bowing is forbidden, whether I believe it or I don't. I don't believe in it. I don't own it. I don't make it. I don't care about it. But you know what happened? The other day, I was walking by a church. <laughs> and I dropped my taxi a hundred dollar bill. Now I'm not that wealthy to throw away on bus. So I <laughs> I'm bound to, to, to the church. But I don't believe in a church. It's not sense. It's still what you do. So how do I get my hundred bucks back? Show me the side. And that works all the time. <laughs> Point is that the prohibition of bowing is in effect. But then it says something very interesting, Mitzvah number 12. You're not allowed to do or serve or worship the idol in the normal way that it is done. So let's read number 12 together. Even if, let's say, it's in a disgraceful manner, for example, uncovering oneself to evacuate the poor or throwing a stone to Marcus. There was an a, 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 a idol called Paor, right? And people would go and they'd pee there. Right? Now, that's pretty disgusting, right? But that was the way they believed it was a proper eviction. Or peeing on the, on, the, on, the, on the idol. Now, I say to myself, you know what? This rotten, terrible idol is disgusting. I'm going to do that. Just to show I hate it. And I just violated the thing. Then there was another one called Maracolis. And the way to throw that one was throw stone at it. So I was walking by one day and I saw Maracolis. And that's a terrible, idol, a horrible idolatry. And I said, that's disgusting. And I picked up the stone to throw out the Maracolis. And guess what? I just violated the thing. Why? Because I worshiped it. In the way that it's done. And that's the prohibition. What about bowing? Suppose, let's say, this particular idol, you don't bow to it. You just, uh, you, you, you just, uh, uh, you, 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 you just uh, throw stones at it. Or maybe you worship it in a nice way, maybe you kneel or something, but, uh, thank you, but, uh, but, but they don't bow. You're still not allowed to bow. The second mitzvah. Mitzvah number eight says bowing is a generic for all idols. To the extent that it's forbidden no matter who, what, when, where. But if the idol calls for this service and you did a different one, no problem. If I did an Islamic service in a church, then it means nothing. I haven't violated. If I do a Christian service in a mosque, I violated nothing. But if I do it the way it's done in Mitzvah number 12, then it becomes a violation of the door. So we have now three extra mitzvahs in number two. Number two, uh, for a total of four mitzvahs in number two. Number two says don't consider idolatry. Don't worship it, right? It's worship. Don't bow to it. And don't involve yourself in a business where you might come to have to own it, buy it, sell it, make it, possess it. All these are separate prohibitions unto themselves. But you believe you don't. Um, I uh, the, the, some guys I'm knocking on the door and says, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, would you like to consider uh, my religion? He said, Well, I'm coming at the door trying to uh, classify you, whatever. Well, 
It's very simple, not, not, not interesting, the point that there's no fascination in the learning about what junk is about. And that's what it is, junk. And so therefore, I don't consider it. But I also cannot get involved in, 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 uh, in, in business with it. And that's not junk, that's money. <laughs> I'm making money selling courses. Yeah, well, that's can do. Uh, bound, can I need the bound down? Get the 100 bucks, can do. Um, the worshiping of it, even if it may be disgraceful, it's still forbidden to us. So we have to understand that these extra mixes are added. So they're really about 14 mixes in the 10 statements, not 10. 14, which means there's 599 others. Hang on to your question. I'm going to introduce you now to the next mix. Okay. Um, so so let, let's just re reiterate again. Do not consider uh, uh, no, no window shopping, right? No window shopping in this mitzvah. Uh, this is called in Hebrew, emuna pshuta, simple faith, simple belief, simple knowledge. What does that mean? That means that I have this instinctively, instinctively awareness inside me of the supreme being. And that can never be replaced. If it does, you're departing from reality. You're departing from your own truth. You're departing from what your heart tells you. And that's this mitzvah number, the, 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 this mitzvah uh, the prohibition of consideration. Um, there was a story told about a Rabbi Amnon. Rabbi Amnon was a uh, great leading scholar, and he um, was continuously pestered by a local bishop to convert to Christianity, or to consider Christianity, or to think about it, or to debate it, and it refused everything. But the, the bishop had a lot of political influence, this and that, and it really was getting to be very difficult for him to resist. And uh, as he continued to, the, this, the, the, uh, the, um, the bishop continued to pester him, he finally said one day in exasperation, you know what, I'll think about it, okay? I'll think about it. And he came home and was absolutely, totally, um, totally destroyed. Totally upset with himself. I had violated and gave him this, this thought that I might consider. So he was summoned to, uh, to discuss it in three days and he refused to show up, which meant a lot of problems in, uh, politically with the bishop. And finally, they did summon him and they brought him in front of the, uh, the, the bishop at the church or whatever. And he, um, uh, he, he um, uh, refused to, to, uh, to, to sit in discussion and they uh, tortured him. Um, and he submitted to the torture. He felt he was he, he deserved this punishment from Hashem for this terrible deed. And so then he um, he went home, and he was dying. And um, came Rosh Hashanah. And in Rosh Hashanah, he walked into the shul uh, towards the end, towards Musa. And just before the kedusha, Musa, um, he uttered a prayer called. The world famous Unasana Tokev. Unasana Tokev today is um, the most famous of all Russia. And it's a prayer that writes about um, the, 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 the declarations of, um, of, 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 the, of judgment. In Rosh Hashanah it is written, Yom Kippur it is sealed, who will live, who will die, who in the right time and the wrong time, who in this man and that man. Who will suffer, who will not, who will become wealthy, who will become poor, and over and over again, all these things. During this part of the service, I don't believe that there's a dry eye anywhere in the entire show. There's not a dry eye. And uh, uh, the, the, as the Chazim begins to sing it, we all sing it along with him. Um, it, it is a prayer that Rabbi Amnon composed and uttered on Rosh Hashanah Day that very first time. Uh, and it became uh, 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 actually, after he finished, he died. And he came back to one of his students in a dream seven days later and taught him the prayer. And they asked him to have it introduced into the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur service every year henceforth. It's only, it's only for this very day. But that's simply because he considered it. He gave thought that he would consider it. He was joking even. That's how serious you have to be about maintaining your faith and your truth and realizing 
that you can't be shaken, which simply means that when it comes to performing mitzvahs and having questions or doubts or difficulties, that reaffirmation needs to be made. A reaffirmation of the truth of Hashem is your truth. Don't depart from it. When you depart and do the wrong things, you depart from that. You depart from that knowledge. So therefore, these mitzvahs are part of the Ten Statements. So let's go on to mitzvah, to statements number three, four, and five, which is the first half of the Ten. On the first side of the uh, of the tablets, and number three is do not take the shem's name in vain. Number four is Shabbat. What is Shabbat? We're going to learn about Shabbat. But here's what we're going to learn. We're going to learn. Um, let's go back to the positive mitzvahs, mitzvah number um, nineteen. Mitzvah number 19. There's a mitzvah to make kiddush on Shabbat, to declare the Shabbos holy. Holy means kadosh. What do we call it? Kiddush. Is that right? That's the word we use. So, kiddush means holy the sanctification. Now, I understand that uh, socially and colloquially, uh, in recent times, kiddush means food. Yay, let's kiddush. Oh, today. All right, some people come late, they come from the airport called JFK. Come just for Kiddush. You ever hear those people? Those, 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 those unfashionably late covers, right? So the truth is, is that it's it, it become known for, for food. Kiddush is exactly the opposite. It's not for, for physical at all, it's about spiritual. It's about Kadosh, holy. It's about taking the physical and making it into holy. That's the idea. So, how do you do that? The first thing you got to do is realize that the day itself. Besides the food, besides the chocolate, besides the, the kumbu and the habib, no the other goodness, right? It is also the day itself. And frankly, even when you teach your kids, you know, kids who uh, identify shops with long tops, come true with a lot of things. Because of the shops, you don't get them when you teach them when you finish the shops. Get the notion of day. We have to declare the day shops. When do you think might be the best time to make this declaration, which we call a kiddush? That's the best time to do it in our shops. You say after moves out. Um, time or? Oh, yeah, so that's your opinion. Okay. I know some people that are like, there's a kiddish guy. I didn't write those words. Yeah. Oh, I love the one. Okay. So you say after moves out. Anybody has another opinion? Yes? Over wine at Shabbos dinner. Over wine at Shabbos dinner. Okay. Third opinion. At the exact moment of the inauguration of Shabbos, before dinner, before Musa, will you inaugurate the day? The moment God comes. And you make the rock. And we do my chance to make the rock. Blessed you, Hashem. Kenan and Achorin, and Hashem, it's one of the songs you've done that you made and gave us a mitzvah. The mitzvah is the Havlet Ne'er Shell. But then you had a word. Shabbos Kodesh, and the word Kodesh. By adding the word Kodesh, you have now sanctified the day. You have done this mitzvah. And this is the mitzvah of the Torah, which is the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment is, or fourth statement, I should say, is remember the Shabbos, that's what it says. Right? Remember the Shabbos day to keep it holy, right? That's right. Shmos 28, verse 8, chapter 20. So in other words, as the Shabbos day comes in, I got to say the word Kodesh. Now, that's for the women. The men will go to Shul and say the Kadesh Hashanahs in Dominic when they say the evening service tomorrow. Now, husband and wife and family get together at home at dinner and they'll make another kid drop a lot. Why do we do that? We've already done it. I've already declared Shabbos is holy. What do I need another declaration for? The answer is it should be done. Declaring the Shabbos with bread, at food, at bread. It's got to be together with the physical experience of the Shabbos. That's the whole idea of, of Shabbos. That I'm taking something in this world, this physical entity, 
and bringing the Kedusha, the heavenly holiness, down here. Shabbos is known as a share or a part or a portion of experience in the world to come. Now, if you realize that the world to come, if you believe in the world to come as a spiritual experience, so then you know that physicality doesn't exist in Shabbos. But then you eat. So you are physical in Shabbos. The answer is that physicality has to be infused with the holiness of above. Now, of course, you can have a real Shabbos. The real, real Shabbos, the ultimate Shabbos, is a poor. And there's nothing physical at all. There's no reason to be clean. Those are the wife get out of patience. You can't even wash your hands and face. You have uh, no leather shoes, you have regular, uh, no non leather shoes. You can't anoint yourself with oils. All these restrictions help create a spiritual atmosphere in which you feel that you're just not here. And that's what Yom Kippur is all about. We talked about it at the time Yom Kippur. Yeah, yeah. You can have experiences, out of body, out of worldly experience. Shabbos is a bit of that. Shabbos is known as a taste of the world to come. But it does infuse his value, except you can't prepare it, you can't cook it, you can't work for it, you can't drive to get it. And there are this experience of Shabbos Kedusha. And therefore, I take it and make another kiddush, another declaration over a cup of wine at the Shabbos dinner. Now, the Shabbos dinner <clears throat> is um, going to be an experience because it's going to be the first of three years. The Shabbos really does engage ourselves in physicality. Each one of the physicalities is in, imbued with, uh, with the, the, the spirituality of the wine, and, and particularly wine, uh, <clears throat> because wine is that again, that sort of a little bit of an out of body experience. You know, it's uh, a little more stimulating than the drink and coke. You know, I'm my dog, not, not. <laughs> a coke, I, I get pretty stimulated with coke myself. But, uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a stimulation, it's an experience. You know? And that has to be together with the meal. So the question arises, how do you make the kiddush? So you make the kiddush before you start the meal or after you start the meal? Before, which is kind of strange. Because you start the meal with bread. If you had a, a, during the week, Monday or Tuesday, a piece of bread and a glass of wine, which would you make the broth on first? The bread. Bread is a staff of life. Wine's an extra. Bread is, it, it, it certainly comes first. But Shabbat is different. Because Shabbat says that the wine stimulant must be the experience of sanctifying the entire meal if it comes first. Only time it does. Now, I, I make the kiddush, then of course I start the meal. I have, uh, as you know, uh, bread which starts the meal, and, uh, and you know that, that becomes a problem. It's so those gluten-free people and stuff. You got to find get it in or whatever it is. But uh, but 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 you really but you really have to uh, uh, bread, bread is the standard of life, uh, and uh, it is the, the essential. A mozi lechem in arts is the essential, the essential bracha. Uh, but once you make that bracha, as you well know, all the rest of the meal does not require. Any other problems at all? And all the other fruits and vegetables are there. But um, though dessert does require, because dessert isn't really part of the meal, certainly. What would be <clears throat> if, let's say, in the middle of the week, I washed for bread and ate a piece of bread uh, and then wanted a cup of wine? Would the washing exempt me from the wine and the bracha bird could have gotten, or would I have to make another bird could have gotten anyway? You gotta make another one anyway. The wine's not too, too, too distinct and too important. So I saw the shower's meal with the wine, make this kiddush, um, and the bread that I have is not cut but whole. The show Hashem's gift in its fullness. And that wholeness has to be twice. Why? We talked about it with the dog. With the dog, we said that Hashem introduced to us the notion of a Shabbos. And introducing to us the notion of the Shabbos, he said that you can't go out and collect the one that you need to eat or your wages or whatever else you want to collect um, and, 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 or, or, or fruit from the ground or reap from, from trees uh, or, 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 or vegetables or whatever. Got to be all prepared from beforehand. So therefore, you have to have an extra loaf for the double portion of 
Friday, and Shabbat. That's the way it was in the morning in the desert. That's the way it is nowadays. Double portion. Uh, the double portion means that I'm holding two chalas in my hand when I um, when I make the bracha, and I'm holding the two chalas in my hand, uh, and I make the bracha in this fashion. I do so with um, one on top of the other. On Friday night, I cut the bottom loaf. On Shabbat day, I cut the top loaf. Uh, during Surah Shlishi, again, cut the top loaf. Or sometimes say both. But we also talked about the fact that when you buy these chalas at home nowadays, or you can bake them or buy them from the bakery, we suggested the idea that you really don't need, unless you have a lot of people, for you to, to do the trick. Because if you have four, then you got two Friday night with one left over, another two Shabbat morning with two left over, and that two left over is done on the, um, uh, on the Sudash, we the third meal, with one left over for the Saturday night meal as a post escort of Malava Malka to the Queen Shabbat. So the idea is, is that Kiddush is a very important mitzvah. So let's take a look at it. Number 19. Torah teaches, remember the Shabbos day to keep it all. How do you remember things? I'll tell you how I remember. Well, you get a little older, you, know, you forget things, you know. What's your name? What's your name? Who you are? You forget things. Now, I'm at the out at the airport and I see uh, gate 28. Now I like the bed. So I'm walking down the aisle, walking down the terminal, right? 28, 28, 28, 28. I got some weird over there. But I have to do it because I don't forget. The best way to remember something is a word of double lines. Both double lines. Say it. Say Shabbat Kodesh. Say the Kadesh of Shabbat. Then you know it's there. And that's why we have this mitzvah called Kiddush. Because it says in the Torah, remember. What does remember mean? Verbalize. That's how I know to do this mitzvah. Every time we do something, I got to acknowledge its source. My children ask me, my grandchildren ask me, why we do this? Why do we do that? You got to be able to answer. The reason is because here it's written. You got to find your chapter. You got to find your verse. That's what a Chavaz Chaim does this for you in the book. And that's why it's so valuable. Shmo 20, chapter 8. Look it up. Remember the Shabbos day to keep it holy. Holy Kadosh. Saves of blessed memory said, hallow it with words on its arrival with Kiddush, the benediction, and its departure also. Say goodbye to Shabbat with one. Abdallah, right? It is the law of the sages to recite the Kiddush over wine or over bread. And it's likewise the law of the sages to recite the Abdallah and its departure over wine or over some other drink which is accepted beverage in the region. Beer can also be used. It is forbidden to taste anything before Kiddush or Havdalah. That means on Friday, once you like candles and sunset comes in, you are not permitted to eat or drink or taste the soup to see if it's good until Kiddush. If you're hungry, that's all for work. You can do Bali, you chew, and then you make the Kiddush. Shabbat morning. Okay, have a little bit, maybe a little bit. Less, yeah, Let's say for Let's say for chapter five. Right. Well, there's a Chabad deal that they don't make you between six and seven. But I wouldn't worry about it. I have everything. So, well, about. you know, you come up for work and you're a little hungry. You want to nosh a little Yeah, but uh, and as long as before Shabbat. Right. Before Shabbat is closed, before sunset. That's fine. Okay. Once sunset sets in, then you can't make Kiddush anymore. Um, and then you can't eat anymore until Kiddush. A Shabbat morning, you have a little coffee or tea in the morning. You don't really you should do much more than that because you, you, you want to pray properly. You go to, you, to pray and you pray the Shabbat and the Musaf, and then you go for another Kiddush and you do not eat a drink until the Rabbi makes the Kiddush. Right? When I, when I had my shul and we left the, 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 the Dalmans to go for the Kiddush, I stare everybody down in Kiddush. <laughs> Isn't there some Until Kiddush? Isn't there some sort of Kiddush? Isn't there some sort of Kiddush? What? It seems unethical and, and, and outside of an etiquette base. Yeah. And people start to clamor and grab before. Correct. How do you, how do you reconcile that? Reconcile that. I mean, it's right. 
Is there like a nonverbal? But then we did, but, but we, we came creative. You know what we did? We developed a very new scientific method of getting food uh, and, and quicker. You're, let's say you're in the back of the line, maybe three or four lines in front of you, you want to get all the way to the herring, you know? We created this elongated herring fork, which you press the button, you know, and <laughs> beep, 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 and you can just push it over there and get that piece of herring you want, and it grabs it and puts it right back to the four lines of people. We sell it for $500. You can wait for that. It ain't worth 500 bucks. I mean, again, you know, you try to behave yourself at the kibbutz, you know, and uh, by the time you get there, maybe nothing's left. You feel bad. It's, it's most disheartening. Most disheartening. Most disheartening. On the other hand, you're on the launch, don't worry about it. There's kibbutz there. And anyway, okay, so Alex brings in the point. Please, uh, we'll, we'll add his point to it. Thou shalt not be a slob. Or a bump, right? Okay, anyway, the mitzvah of Kiddush is um, uh, say goodbye to Shabbat with, with wine as well. But let's, let's make this distinction. The mitzvah of Kiddush itself is a Torah mitzvah, right here, one of the 613. The mitzvah of Kiddush over wine. Rabbanon. It is not Torah law. It is rabbinic. So let's appreciate that rabbinic law is as valuable and as popular to us as regular Torah law. Because every law that the rabbis teach us is what? Is it was um, it was um, uh, authorized by the Torah. There's a passage in the Torah that says, listen to the rabbis. And because it's such a mitzvah, Every time we do what they tell us, we are performing a Torah mitzvah. They will understand that. Okay, then. There are seven mitzvahs that are born. Talked about this a hundred times. Yes. And there are also thousands of decrees and thousands of rules. A decree is called a gzero. A rule is called a takana. These are the three areas of legislation of rabbinic law. That is found in the Talmud. Your job is to identify which rabbinic law it is. Is it a mitzvah? Is it a zera or a takam? Well, it mitzvahs identifying these, only seven of them. It's not hard to memorize, right? Anyone want to tell me one of the seven mitzvahs that I want? Just one. Keep it. No, keep it as a ruling. Keep us not a mitzvah. It's a ruling. Same brothers. Same brothers. All the brothers we say are all the Rabbanan, except for Rikat Hamazon when you bench. How do we know that? Because there's a passage for it. And you can find Rikat Hamazon in Mitzvah number, Mitzvah number 14, 15, 16, Mitzvah number 13. Gotta be well versed in this, folks. Mitzvah number 13, go over the book, read, read the book, read the mitzvahs, learn them. And then, okay, a person's going now, they get converted, and they think they go down with the, with the mitzvah book. No, you should be reviewing it every day. I review the mitzvah book twice a year. The last 50 years. You think I'm joking? <laughs> so, you get the idea that, that you want to be able to distinguish, okay? So keep us a ruling. How about brachas? That's the abundant. That's a mitzvah that I wanted. That's one of the seven. Give me another of the seven mitzvahs that I wanted. Anybody? Reading uh, Esther. Reading Esther. Purim. Beautiful. Purim happened way after the Torah was given. Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Ask three off the top. Guess what? Lighting candles on Friday night is a mitzvah that I born on. It is nowhere written in the book. And you need to know that source because if you don't know the source, how do you not understand why you're doing what you're doing? What I'm doing is I'm following the commandments of the rabbis, but that's not a ruling of the rabbis, it's a mitzvah of the rabbis. And there are only seven of them. I'm often memorized. But let's understand if I'm going to do the mitzvah of candle lighting and I'm going to say the bracha. I share to you, show for the sake of bless God for and, 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 and the king of the world that he commanded me to light Chabot candles. That's incorrect. Because God didn't command it. Who did? The rabbis did. How did I say the bracha? Because Hashem gave the power to the rabbis, the rabbis gave it to them to make the bracha. 
because Hashem told us to listen to the rabbis. Bless you, Hashem, King of the world. Think about this when you're saying the bracha. Hashem to Yishana, with whom God made us holy. The mitzvah, so with your mitzvahs. Mitzvah, vanu, and you commanded us to do what? To listen to the rabbis, who in turn commanded us to do whatever. You get the idea? So, and the broth itself is that abundant. Can you light that abundant? And the broth that you said is that abundant. And the broth that you said is that abundant is the kind of broth that, um, that um, uh, is the broth of a mitzvah as different than a broth that you make for less water. There's a broth of pleasure and there's a broth of mitzvah. How can you tell the difference? Real easy. Four words. What are the four words? Share to be shun into the Tavit Sivan. Then you know it's a mitzvah bracha. Otherwise, otherwise, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure bracha. Now, mezuzah, it's a bracha. Share to be shun into the Tavit Sivan. The Shem commanded me to put a mezuzah. Till there's a bracha. Is there a bracha to recite the Kiddush? The answer is yes. Tell the long one, not the shorty, the biggie. But it's a broth of mix. So you have to really be on your toes in terms of knowing the source and knowing how we keep the Shabbat properly. And in keeping the Shabbat properly, then we say you have to do a Kiddush. The Kiddush really is represented of all the positives of Shabbos, all the spirituality of Shabbos, from the Shul, the Tan, learn Torah, do mitzvahs, invite people, listen to the rabbi speech, make brachas, everything is talk to great Torah, talk about the parasha. Now, you want to get off the world, that is not been at the table, it's done. What do you like to the table? And I get the, the, lowest, uh, the lowest price in your insurance? No. You want to talk about what he says in the parasha? How do we learn a good moral lesson? Right? Then this Friday night, I, I couldn't sleep. I got up at 4 a.m. I spent an hour learning uh, with my my, my, my readings, uh, a book on, on the commentary of the parish. I tell you, I see in my readings for an easy first four or five I see my readings for a first four hours. It took me four or five years. Right? Amazing. What an amazing feeling that they're, they're, like, I'm a student back in the Shul in Yeshiva. I'm, 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 I'm still the, the, the 18. Wow. I feel that. Way. It's, it's so exciting. So <clears throat> the idea is this is how you keep Shabbos and the sanctity, holiness. And that's the case. Um, is it forbidden to uh, use money in Shabbat? Of course. Uh, is it forbidden to live to go to store by Shabbat? No. no. Is it forbidden? Yeah, forbidden to buy something in the store. Shabbat. Yes, it's been um, Is that a prohibition of the Torah or a prohibition of the rabbis? Torah. Rabbis are the now stores. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Let you know, secret to the church. <laughs> Let's turn back to the path of Nebi, second half of the book, the mitzvah number six. I remember this, folks, what we learned today. You're remembering? Number six. There's a negative commandment do not do work on Shabbos. And the rabbis taught us 39 forbidden labors, 39 forbidden primary kinds of labors. And all those labors that are similar to them all fall into the same category. There could be a hundred different labors in each one of its primaries. One of the primaries, you can't write with a pencil on Chavez. Because you can't erase. Is that correct? Okay. Are you permitted on Chavez to buy a cake? Happy birthday, Joe Blow. Whatever that is, right? Can you cut into that cake on Chavez? Why not? You're erasing, but it's not real erasing. It happens between what is called a primary and a derivative. There are 100 derivatives in each primary. Maybe 200. I don't know. 
But one thing is for sure. What do you want to say? No? So one thing is for sure is that these prohibitions, none of them is money. No ways to say money. So that's a rabbinic one. It's a rabbinic one. But then it's the same to us, right? Because who authorized rabbinic law? The Torah. Is this a rabbinic a prohibition of money? Is it a rabbinic mitzvah? A rabbinic ruling? Or a rabbinic decree? So we learn that that's a rabbinic ruling. It's a ruling. What's the difference between a ruling and a decree? That's not for today. It's a little too difficult. But at least you know the difference between a ruling and a decree needs to be the seven mitzvahs. So now, the mitzvah of seven mitzvahs is candlelighting, it's brachas, it's Purim, it's Hanukkah, it's hand washing. Did the hand washing happen uh, after the uh, plague, the Black Plague in Europe? No. How did that? No. Okay, so what happened to facilitate that action? What facilitated that action was the fact that the rabbis saw way back when, long before the Black Plague, that a Kohen was required to wash his hand before he ate his Kohanic food called the Truma, but it was very holy food. Right, and he could only eat that in the temple. And only with clean hands. Therefore, the rabbis instituted that everyone should have clean hands for bread. You never know if it might be Truma or it might not be. It might be something you, you, you took off and you forgot to give to the Kohen. And therefore, you're eating it, you better have your hands clean. So, number six says, do not violate Shabbos. So now what are we learning here is that these two mitzvahs of Shabbos are hand in hand. In the statement number four, which is don't, don't violate Shabbos, in statement number four, which is don't violate Shabbos, there's an additional mitzvah called, no, I'm sorry, the statement number four is, is, is uh, remember Shabbos, keep it holy, the positives, there's an additional mitzvah called the negative, don't do any work. And that's your extra mitzvah. We have three extras in the prohibition of idolatry, and one extra in the prohibition of and in the obligation of Shabbat. That extra one is don't do any work. So now I've got four extra mitzvahs, right? Not, it's not, not 10 commandments, but 14 commandments in 10 statements. Correct. Now, <clears throat> this prohibition of do not do work on Shabbos is connected to make Shabbos holy, which means they're interconnected. Which means one depends upon the other. To truly keep Shabbos properly, you have to have both elements. If let's say <clears throat> uh, I uh, drive the shul on Shabbat, well, it's lovely to make Shabbat, you know, uh, holy and go to shul, but you violated the negatives. You're not keeping Shabbat. How about the opposite? How about the opposite is let's say um, uh, I decided. Uh, not to turn on the television on Shabbat, that's a violation, but I put it on a timer because I want to watch the baseball game. You lost good news, sir. The World Series. <laughs> and the answer is yes. You got your negatives in, but not your positives. You're distracted with a baseball game on Shabbat. And therefore, they're not doing it. Shabbat is a dual activity, internet. Yeah. So what are the lines where we have the Shabbos story and you know, it's like prescribed things that they... Right, so one of the prohibitions of Shabbat is you can't tell a boy to do Shabbat work for you, correct? Right? Is that a derisive or is that a derabon? Is that from the Torah or that from the rabbi? Rabbi. It's a ruling. Um, it's, it's a ruling. And in fact, it's not even a ruling, it's a decree. They, it's, decrees make the rules strict. So they made the rules strict. Can't tell a non to work for you on Shabbat. You could in a desperate situation. It can't be direct. It can't be direct number one, and it could have to be in a tough spot. Um, now, we had one for a tough spot where we had about um, maybe 100 people in the shul dancing a simple story, and the lights went out. And that's pretty dangerous, particularly when you have a lot of kids, little kids on the feet, and to the guard. And so I had no problem telling the laundry, please open the open lights. Because I have a desperate situation. Uh, and the Rabbana do not make decrees in desperate spots. It's to optimize the rules of strength, not decrease. So, in a dangerous spot like that, the rules are going to be blocked. So, um, 
Uh, I, I told him <laughs> before the non Jews were born. Rabbi? Yeah. Um, I was talking with uh, Rabbi once today, and I had, had to go up the line when that's on that same thing about the Tavis book. Right. But he said, because they're not their servants, but they're not, um, they're not, you know, the servants that are going to possibly convert the future, like they're not the, the, so that doesn't count. It was kind of like um, Eliezer. He wasn't the type of servant that was um, a, a better was it convert. Convert. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm not sure exactly how I understand that, though I do know that a, a, a convert is required to make one mistake up until the time of the conversion itself, uh, which may, and Shabbat is exclusively a Jewish gift, which is interesting because it really should be a worldly gift. I mean, Shabbat, uh, or every holiday we do represents a, a historical event in Jewish history. Shabbat represents not a Jewish event, a world event. World created, God rested on the seventh day. So how come the God won't be Shabbos? And it says so specifically that the God not permitted to be Shabbos. Person on the panel makes a mistake until the final Shabbos when they finally do keep the Shabbos. So what's the point? Point is, is that somehow or another the message of Shabbat and the way it works is not accessible to the world. Too much. Too many details, too many rules, and too many, uh, too much intensity within a 24 hour period. Yes. How much is the rabbi to some that say this word conversion that should at least should not make the mistake? Should, yeah, should like switch a line or something right before you? Yeah, there are a lot of people do that. A lot of people do that. Yeah. Not be trouble for you. Yeah, I thought a lot of people do that. And that's correct. Um, you have a piece of toilet paper. Why do you want to trouble I mean, except for that one mistake. You make that one mistake. Um, you make it uh, 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 after candle lighting? Yes, you do. But but you make that one mistake. You have to, even if you're in the process. Right, right. In the process, you should make. Yeah. yeah. You should make the one mistake. But then again, you have to feel, you have to understand what am I doing by flipping on the switch? What am I doing by doing this one day? I'm doing. I'm doing. Now, my wife is going to play Friday night. Go over the teas, get into the car. So, what she wants me to do. She wants me to break shop. So, you feel that you're doing God's will. Understand? So, the bottom line is do what God wants you to do. Not always does it fit into the mold or to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, to, to the system that we feel. Sometimes everybody's got to say you right certain things in life. Sometimes you gotta do this, sometimes you gotta do that. I had to tell them not to open the lights. So I have a question. Um who me. <laughs> um, so in my situation, <laughs> so um what what's a dire situation? A dire? Because a dire? Yeah, it's like really so, dire. No, well, someone ate a fish bone in water. So this might happen. A fish bone. During Yanta, but it was it's a small, it. small fish bone, and then the guy was in his, you know, coughing, but right. he wasn't showing that he was nervous and he was very paranoid. Yeah. And so, in my in my situation, I'm like, Hold on. Well, I, I drove him to like the, the ER because we didn't know. He Good, had move. Never experienced. Good move. Good move. But then, like, there was another person who wanted to be very, I don't know, criticizing and like, Oh, I, I had that before. It's not life threatening. You shouldn't break it. But if if don't I were a Jewish person, don't break it. Right, like never play games with life. Uh -huh. Be wrong. Error on the error on the possibility of a violation of Shabbos rather than error on a person a positive person's life. Sure. No question about it. Okay. So it's Yom Kippur. And somebody comes up to me, middle of the service, maybe two o'clock in the afternoon. I'm feeling very busy. Sorry, oh, hang on. So the first thing I do. As I take this fellow, I take him out of the shoe to the water fountain, and I give him water. <laughs> and I'm like, you look good. But you're busy. Frank, you never play games with life. All of our babies were born on Thursday, except one. My wife went into labor. I said, you're faking it. Such
Oh, no, no, you, you, you. So someone says committed adultery and they're playing with guns. That's right. One of them, someone says, either one of the women, you gotta die. I mean, you can fight back too, but you can't, but you can't violate. It's forbidden to violate. Shabbos. It's forbidden to violate uh, a mitzvah, uh, uh, um, uh, those kind of mitzvahs, or murder. Um, we put into a situation that we forbid where. Uh, and said so the Nazis want you to cooperate. They say you'll kill this Jew, or see keep you alive. Amen. Those are the three things that supersede human life. And the reason they oh, supersede human life is because if you violate them, life it will live. Basically. And so Shabbos is certainly a violation that you can violate uh, and to save a life and so forth. Um, I want to bring to your attention. Um, uh, the, the um, uh, let, let's turn to page 104, the very next page on the on the midst of Shabbos, where it says over there, any violation of Shabbos is punishable by death if, in fact, it was done willfully and done with proper scolding and warning. Uh, why? And the answer is because every one of the 10 statements violated is punishable by death. If you don't believe in God, you commit adultery, you kill you. You commit murder, you kill you. You commit stealing, what kind of stealing? Kidnapping is what it means. Kidnapping is punishable by death. Right? We all understand how horrible it was when Joseph's brother sold him away from his home, right? Punishable by death. Um, Shabbos is punishable by death. Um, taking God's name in vain is punishable by death. Honoring your mother and father, number five. It says you have one life. You don't honor them, you're not sure what. So it's all, all these things are recognitions of Hashem, you see? Every one of the 10 statements was selected as the being the 10 on the tablets in order, not that it's superior to the 613 or to the other 599, but because of the fact that these are the 10 that firmly established the belief in God to the extent that without it, you're dead. So we talked about the two tablets. First five, second five. First five between man and Hashem. Second five, social rules between Persons and persons. So you, I'm ashamed. You can't believe in another, another God. You have to um, can't swear in God's name. And there's a famous story at the end of the book of Leviticus, the third book, which talks about a man who cursed God's name, who was punishable by death. Um, uh, keeping Shabbos, punishable by death, if you violate Shabbos, and on the it says uh, shortened life. Murder, number six. So by death. Adultery is number seven. Um, right. And then I've asked wit. The witness is the proper one. Uh, the, the prohibition of kidnapping, but for my death. Number nine, the uh, uh, the uh, prohibition of bearing false witness, lying. When you accuse, two people come in and accuse Joe of killing John, and maybe Joe did. But they couldn't have witnessed it because they were in California at the time when the murder took place in New York. These are false witnesses that receive the same penalty, the penalty of death. You covet your neighbor's wife, you deserve death. So let's understand, therefore, that the correlation between man and man, those witnesses, and the witnesses between man and God, uh, man and God, are correlated across the board. One through six, two through seven, three through eight, four through nine, and five and ten. Why does one equal six? One is God. Six is don't commit murder. What's the similarity? He would give life. The other one would take. What's the similarity between other people going out of God and adultery? What's the uh, the the, the uh, correlation between 
Don't take God's name in vain. Don't steal. When you use his name, you're still in it. Right. Unless you unless you're using it in the prayer or 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 whatever. Or right. What's the similarity between Shabbos and don't bear false witness? If you don't keep it, you bear false witness. If you do keep it, then you're testifying to the fact that God rested on the sixth day and rested on the seventh. That's what you're testifying that God created the world six days and rested on the seventh. But if you work on the seventh, then you're testifying or by your actions, not even acknowledging the truth of creation. You're denying God. Person who violates Shabbos, man in the part of our people. Person who violates Shabbos is uh, punishable by death. But you said, as I've witnessed, but the witnesses are inadequate unless uh, and you have to coach the witnesses themselves, of course, but they also have to adequately warn the guy. We just got angry at this guy. Just the Bible says, you're a terrible thing. Pick up the gun. And you're angry, you can't be stopped. So I warn you, don't do it, you're ruining your life. I know, what that guy 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 Oh, the floor, the floor, the floor, the floor, the floor, the right? So, so he's, he's banging on a banging on his knee, right? And then, or banging with his knee on his neck. Is that what happened, right? Why did some cop come over and stop him and say, "Look, you hit, you're killing your life. Forget him. What about your life? Look at the same prison for twenty five years. He do this. Well, That's one. That would have stopped him. Nobody stepped up. And the guy really is not responsible unless he's really mad at him. That's the truth. Because it's not really premeditated. He's angry. So if you're angry at someone and you kill him, rather than a premeditated cold blooded murder, what's the difference? One is murder, one is manslaughter. Okay, so you did a bad thing. So what do we do with such a bad guy who commits a, 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 that kind of a murder? Well, one way is we can let him go free. And guarantee that Hashem will somehow or another make sure that somebody hits him with a car or something. Trust Hashem, and it'll happen, and then rejoice. Uh, <laughs> or, or what you could do <clears throat> is you could banish him to the city of refuge, right? In the prison. He stays there for until, until the coin dies. Until the coin dies. So everybody, of course, is poor coin feels terrible. Everyone's praying for his death. Tell him to die, get free. So the mothers of the Kohanim would run to those cities of refuge, to those prisons, and they provide them the elaborate meals and they'd give them banquets. See, so you, you don't want my husband to die. Better already have a good time over there. Huh? People say that prison was uh, wasn't uh, so bad. You know, it's it's banishment because you can't you're not free to move around. But uh, but the idea of um, <laughs> the, the idea of uh, uh, of, of uh, imprisonment, you don't know, suffer that. You don't know, suffer this. When you say punishable by death, do you mean a spiritual death or a physical death? Physical death. There's a, there's a, but that like, human can't commit that. No, the best, the, the best thing is also right to do. It's not murder? No. Kill it. I just enlisted in this very long. Shoot 20 hours that coming in. That work? 20 hours coming in. 20 hours are coming in. Okay. That's what it is. Yay! <laughs> so, I read this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, there is a prohibition. The, the, the punishment is, of course, as I said, death because all 10 are punishable by death. But realize the correlation between 1 and 6, 2 and 7, 3 and 8, because why? Because it's a correlation between your obligation to Hashem and the connection to that to your obligation to mankind. You're obligated not to kill a man because you're God. You're obligated not to uh, kidnap a man because you honor God's name. You're obligated to tell the truth. It's a good job. It's all correlated. Therefore, we have dual responsibility. Your question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Oh, uh, idolatry, murder, and adultery, or any, any form of a pro, a pro, a prohibited religion. Man is lying in the hospital dying, and he's in love with this married woman, and the uh, he says to the doctor, I have no will to live. The doctor says, bring the girl, maybe I'll wait. Let him die. Basically, <laughs> I mean, you, you can't violate the basis of life, basically put. So therefore, let, let's also read, let's conclude 104 here. We are careful, we are reward, uh, um, we are told that um, um, uh, th there are many other rules about Shabbat, including the prohibition of um, the Rabbanon. You see Shavuot, it's called the Shavuot over there on, on page 105, the Shavuot, which are laws of the Rabbanon that are forbidden sages. And they're called fences. Those fences are called decrees, not mitzvahs, decrees. There's thousands of them. You got to be really in touch with them as much as you possibly can. We are careful not to do any do any work with our animals. You can't uh, tell your dog, uh, run out to the street and fetch my paper, um, uh, and have him carry it in and out between the outside and the inside. Uh, you know, the dog does no difference, but you can't have you can't have your dog do it. So if you can't have your dog do it, you certainly can't have him want you do it. Now, um, and this is called again a shmut drabonon. Um, However, Shabbos is pushed aside and may be thrust aside and labor done where there is a danger to human life. Shabbos is equal in importance to all the mitzvot. It's a sign between the Hashem and the Jewish people. Someone violates the Shabbos willfully, fragrantly, he is like a heathen in every respect. It's a sign between Hashem and the Jewish people. We can tell me other three signs. There are three signs that make the Jew special to Hashem. One of them is Shabbat. What are the other two? Say again. Bismillah is right. Who said that? What's he doing? Who said it? Oh, yay. Uh, okay, and so I'll sit over there next time. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, too, this, this machine here is immovable. <laughs> I don't mind if the dollar is the money's not so good. Anyway, the, the point is that the, risk of the, the circumcision is one, and the other one is um, the other third one is Tum. It's an oat. Sign. Of course, you'll note that uh, two of them do not apply to women, but really they do. Because uh, there are counterparts. Female counterparts, the female counterpart to the circumcision, to the midst of Nida, in the midst of, of uh, maintaining uh, proper uh, restrictions during the Nida period and the immersion with uh, preparation of such. The connection between Tefillin for women, well, first of all, one easy connection is that a woman is obligated to pick her husband and have her house in the morning, make sure he goes to the house and put on Tefillin. <laughs> if she's not doing that, then she's failing the bill. For her, if a, a, a religious woman marries a guy who's not religious, not putting on film, so uh, what do we got it? Right? Uh, right? The, the, the real, also, uh, other issues of the film really is a, is a form of a box. And the box is called a bite. It's a bite house. A house. And the most important mix in the house that women are specifically responsible for is keeping the house kosher. And those are the signs that make the Jew unique to our shame. So we went through the 10 statements today. We went through the 14 commandments that are in, in the statements. We focused in on the belief in Hashem. We focused in on the prohibition to consider anything else. We focused in on the mitzvah of Shabbat. And there are two mitzvahs of Shabbat. One is the positive. One is the negative. The positive is all the do's, all the wonderful symptoms, and, and, and happy obligations, happy observances of Shabbat, the spirituality of Shabbat, prayer, the shul, I mean, guy, the guy who was on Shabbat. I mean, I did very much remember the original COVID. Really, that when they just this allowed you, I went out of my mind. I went out of my mind. I mean, literally, I had mean, the person living out of Shabbat. I had the person living out of the Davening together with the, with, the, with, the, with the public prayer service, and, uh, and of course, obviously the candles, obviously the kiddush, obviously the festive meal. I was going to bless them to say, or the different Torah would say, spiritual excitement of what the Shabbat day should be. It can't be simply going to shul. It's got to be a full day's experience. And the going can't do that. They like to do their Sabbath on a Sunday. 
Very nice. So they go to church and they go home and watch the NFL. Right? The players go on and play. Who's playing today? San Francisco? <clears throat> Tampa Bay. Whoa, big game today. Tampa Bay in LA. What would be if Tampa Bay was playing LA yesterday in Shabbat? And you're a big fan? Once in my life, once in my life, I had a temptation to look at a newspaper and see if my team won. <laughs> once I was 22. <laughs> I'm an at this age of six, and I'm a big fan. A big fan. So <laughs> you have to know, but 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 to push this on. Yes, sir. You can't you can't see the news if it's a newspaper, like they well, I say, yeah, I guess you're good. I guess you're good. I mean, I'm technically speaking, you want to be technical about it. So you walk by the new stand, you understand? And uh, after all, you don't want to buy it at Shabbat, so you're not going to buy the paper, right? right? And you can't walk into the store, but the new stand is outside. You can see the new stand from the outside, right? right? Yeah. So you walk over and you look at the paper, and guess what happens? Yeah, the Shabbat is miserable. That's on you. <laughs> well, then you shouldn't have done it in the first place. <laughs> now, you got with Phoenix, you haven't got a great track record of winning. <laughs> you got lots of kids. This year, you got good people. Anyway, I'm not totally good this year. Anyway, so uh, th that's the, the notion of Shabbat. Uh, I want to bring to your attention that um, um, in the learning of the mitzvot, uh, we did one and um, one and eight in the positive. Um, uh, and um, one and eight, and uh, we did in the negatives uh, and, uh, four, uh, six and eight, and the positives it was one and Shabbat one and nineteen. Sorry, one and nineteen. But I will add one more point to Shabbat. That's number twenty. There's an additional mitzvah, and this will answer your question. Yeah, look. Yeah, look. Yeah. Can't take a look. Look, look. All right. It all works out the wash. <laughs> Number 20, there's a mitzvah to rest on Shabbat. That's a positive mitzvah. How is that different than not doing any work? Anybody want to read and tell me? Right there in front of you. So it's kind of tells us. The mitzvah, and it's a positive mitzvah, not a negative. The negatives don't do any work, but positives to rest. What does that mean? That you are required to make sure that no one around you is violating Shabbat and that there's no secularism in the Shabbat and therefore your animals should not work, nor should you tell an on Jew to do any work for you. This is called the Shmus Banan, a rabbinic law. But its source is the Torah. The Torah says, impose upon the day a spirit of Shabbat. That's a positive mitzvah. You may perform the positive mitzvah by refraining from other stuff or in the paper. But anything you do that does a positive in which in which you uh, provide a, 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 a spirit. I mean, I knew one person, for instance, many of you may do it. I know one rabbi that absolutely was um, uh, insistent about being a shaman. So they that. shouldn't do it? He insisted that you should do it. You should. Yeah. Heard, I mean, I've heard Paul. You know, he, he was insistent. I'm taking my nap. I said, can I come and learn? He says, yeah, I'm taking my nap. <laughs> right. So, I mean, again, the, the the idea of the spirit of Shabbat, a little bit extra than you, a little bit more than you, a little bit tastier than you, a little, um, uh, a, a little bit, uh, the extra loaf of bread. Uh, uh, the um, uh, the extra wine, anything at all that contributes to this spirit of Shabbat. Uh, uh, that's a mitzvah of ice. That's a mitzvah of third. That's a number. And that, and many of you may be doing it, and I don't realize you've been performing a mitzvah at the same time. That's mitzvah 19 and 20. So, uh, once again, we learned mitzvah 1, mitzvah 19 and 20 in the positive. We learned a mitzvah uh, 6 and 8 in the negative. Uh, I will bring to your attention that next week, we are going to also, oh, there's one other one on number seven, still late for now. Uh, number seven in the negative is also about Shabbat. We'll talk about that next week. Um, and, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the, uh, about the, uh, uh, the mitzvah 
of, um, of holidays on Mitzvah number 21. So all that's scheduled for next week. This week's partial best on Thursday night is not uh, live. It's Zoomed. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. I'll be back.